I thought maybe we would talk a bit about prophecy. Uh, we have mentioned in all of these meetings that I'm not the authority. The Bible is our authority. God's Word is our authority. To the law and to the testimony, Isaiah 20. We keep repeating it. If they speak not according to this Word, there's no light in them. Uh, I like to speak on university campuses in the United States, and I have uh, been on university campuses in other places, other countries as well. And I don't care how many PhDs, how many professors are in the audience. I, I like to say to them, I will prove to you that God exists. I will prove to you that the Bible is God's word. I will prove to you that Jesus Christ is the true and only Savior of sinners. I will prove to you that the Jews are his chosen people and that land belongs to them. And I challenge anyone to refute it. If you're going to debate me, you're going to lose. Not, not because I'm so smart, but if you have truth on your side, you should be able to win against the lie. Uh, one of the problems is an awful lot of Christians who claim to believe the truth, they don't know that much about it. And I was saying this at a, a be very beautiful place. I wish you could visit it. Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Uh, it's kind of uh, sticky to fly in there. Got all these mountains and glaciers around and the plane has to get in there somehow and, and land. And uh, I was speaking at a church and I mentioned that and I'd never had a challenge like that before. About five people came after me. And they said, now wait a minute. If you can prove it, where's faith? Well, I said, maybe you have a wrong idea about faith. Faith is not a leap in the dark. You don't just decide to believe something because you want to believe something. You have to decide what you're going to believe. <laughs> and you better know why you believe what you believe. One of the problems that I see as I travel around the, uh, the world, we have a lot of young people. They grew up in a, in a fine Christian home, perhaps, a, a good evangelical church. They know what they're supposed to believe, and they even think they believe it until they get into university. And then some bright professor says, oh no, there are a lot of contradictions in the Bible. There are a lot of problems. The Bible isn't scientific. Um, I don't, um, you know, I've tried to be very cautious in quoting people. Um, and I keep saying, don't blame me for what they say. Because I didn't say it and I'm only quoting them. But um, if you would read Billy Graham's autobiography, he tells how in 1949 he had a crisis of faith. And he was preaching, had, uh, had a partner, uh, Chuck Charles uh, Templeton, and they had preached together and his friend Charles Templeton uh, thought that he needed some more education. There's nothing wrong with education. He wanted to go back to seminary uh, to get some advanced degrees. He thought that would make him more effective for the Lord. He went to Princeton Theological Seminary. Now, Princeton originally was a fine evangelical school, like many of our schools in the, in the United States, Harvard and, and so forth. And they turned apostate, and Princeton Theological Seminary was totally apostate. And he lost his faith. And he communicated with Billy Graham. He said, you know, there are some real contradictions in the Bible. There are unscientific statements in the Bible. There are unhistoric statements in the Bible. There are unpsycholo you know, psychologically unsound statements in the Bible. And he communicated some of these to Billy Graham. Billy Graham is a, is a young preacher. He tells you in his autobiography how he got down on his knees in 1949, and he prayed a prayer something like this, Oh God, Chuck has pointed out some of these problems in the Bible, unscientific statements, etc., etc., and I don't have any answers for them, but God, I'm just going to take it by faith that this is your word. 
Now, I don't think that works. If your 18, 20 year old son or daughter comes from university and says, Mom, Dad, the professor has been pointing out to me that there are some real contradictions in the Bible. There are unscientific statements in the Bible. Could you please help me? And you say, take it by faith. That's not faith. Faith has got to have some reasons. And if there are contradictions, if you can show me unscientific statements in the Word of God, if you can show me things in this book that are not true, I'll throw it out. Because you've got to take the whole book. We talked about it uh, the other night. There, it's very popular now to embrace in some of our seminaries, Christian universities embrace theistic evolution. Evolution is a joke. Evolution is not true. Evolution is scientifically unsound. Evolution is mathematically, it's, it's insane mathematically. It couldn't possibly happen and I can prove that to you. We don't even have to talk about fossils, but I won't go into that. You could get the tape. But there are people who are, who are intimidated by science. You know, I'm a, what you call a chartered accountant. Uh, we call them in the United States certified public accountants. And I can remember when I was a young man, I thought, whoa, a chartered accountant, you know. I mean, they never make mistakes. Well, when I became one, I found out that they do. Uh, and I found out that CPAs or C chartered accountants, they're just little boys and little girls that grew up. And the same thing is true of scientists. They're just little boys and little girls who grew up. And they make mistakes. They have prejudices. And there's a very strong prejudice against the belief in God. And that's why they cling to evolution. Because they don't like the other alternative. But as we pointed out uh, Friday night, if I cannot believe what this book says about the origin of man, why should I believe what it says about the destiny of man? If I cannot believe what this book says about Adam and Eve, created by God, and their fall into sin and separation from God, why should I believe what this book says about their redemption and their reconciliation to God? I think I have to be honest when I handle the Word of God. And so these people came up and they said, well, if you can prove it, uh, where does faith come in? I said, wait a minute, maybe you've got a wrong idea about faith. You've got to have a reason why you believe what you believe. The pastor quoted from uh, second, or, or read, I guess, from uh, Second Peter chapter one. Uh, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We'll come to that a, a, a bit more this evening, but we do want to refer to it this morning. But if we went back to uh, 1 Peter 3.15, uh, you should all be able to quote it. I mean, Peter says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready once in a while when you feel like it to give an answer to some people, you know. No, he says, be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks the most exciting emotional experience you ever had with God. Woo, it was fantastic. And I just get so excited when I sing about Jesus. There are a lot of people who's, who sing about loving Jesus, but the Jesus that they love has no connection to the truth that Jesus claimed to be. And Jesus said, someday I will say to people, I never knew you. And in John 17, 3, he says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And Peter says, be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks, what? A reason, a reason of the faith, the hope that is in you with meekness and fear because we are giving this answer before God. Well, does the Bible talk about proofs? I want to get to a really exciting prophecy this morning, but turn first of all to Acts, because prophecy is the great proof. Turn to Acts chapter 1. You know, we have a bit of a, a problem with Roman Catholicism. 
a lot of problems with Roman Catholicism. One of the problems with Roman Catholicism is they say the Bible is not sufficient. Uh, they say that the Bible, in fact, is not scientifically accurate. That's the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that the Bible is accurate when it comes to uh, morals and dogma. But when it comes to history and science, it's not accurate. And furthermore, what you need is tradition and you need the interpretation uh, of the church and so forth. And I've had some debates with the leading Catholic apologists. Uh, uh, for example, debating one of the cries of the reformers, as you re recall, was sola scriptura, was it not? Sola scriptura. The Bible is our authority. Not some man wearing a fancy hat and a long robe. Not some church, no matter who they are, what education they claim to have. The Bible is our authority. Sola Scriptura. And I had a debate with a leading Catholic apologist uh, in the United States, Carl Keating. He's a young attorney. He's a very bright young man. And we were debating from, uh, on radio uh, this topic of Sola Scriptura. And I went to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, which I'm sure you know very well, where Paul writes and he says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable or is to be used for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man, the woman, the boy, the girl of God may be perfect, that means mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Sounds to me like the Bible is all you need to be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so my opponent, uh, uh, the lawyer, Carl Keating, he said, aha, if you're going to try to prove sola scriptura from that scripture, you are proving too much. Why, he says, Cardinal Newman, a hundred years ago, he was a convert from the Anglican Church to the Catholic Church, became a cardinal. Why, Cardinal Newman pointed out that if you're going to prove it from that scripture, you're proving too much because all Timothy had was the Old Testament. Touche, huh? So now you're saying all you need is the Old Testament. I said, really? Well, now this is the second epistle to Timothy. So he does have the first epistle to Timothy. <laughs> and he does have the second epistle now. Uh, furthermore, in chapter 4, Paul says, the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I'm ready now to be offered. And the pastor quoted, unto all them that look for him, there's a crown of righteousness. So we know, in fact, this was the last epistle Paul wrote. <laughs> so Timothy has all of Paul's epistles. <laughs> what made me think of it is how this, uh, this uh, book begins, the book of Acts. Now we know he must have had the book of Acts. Because Paul is the main character in the book of Acts. And you wouldn't end the book of Acts without telling of the death of Paul if he had already died, would you? And then he must have had the book of Luke because this epistle begin, this uh, book of Acts begins, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, <laughs> of all that Jesus began to do and teach and so forth. And you read the book of Luke and it's written to Theophilus. So we know he must have had the book of Luke, too. <laughs> uh, in fact, we know that he had all of the New Testament except the book of Revelation and the, the writings of John. But when God says to the children of, of Israel, uh, Deuteronomy 8, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Is he talking about every word that has proceeded up to that point? No. He's talking about Scripture. When the Bible refers to God's word, it means the whole thing, <clears throat> whether it had all been written at that time or, or not. Well, notice, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I got off on a little story there. We're talking about proof. Verse 3, to whom also he, that is Christ, his disciples, to them, showed himself alive after his passion, that is, after his death, by what? Many infallible proofs. When Jesus stood before his disciples, 
after the resurrection. Remember, he came right through closed doors, right through the wall, whatever, and stood before them. And they thought he was a ghost. And Jesus said, no, just take it by faith. He said, handle me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see me have. Check it out. And for 40 days, he demonstrated to his disciples that it was he himself, the one who had died. He was alive and he was with them. Turn to chapter 9 of Acts and verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. I don't think he's even giving his testimony. Now, he does give his testimony a couple of times in the book of Acts. But upon what is he basing his argument that Christ is the Son of God? Go to verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. See, the Bible doesn't say, Jesus didn't say, go into all the world and dialogue. We keep repeating that. But somehow, dialoguing has gotten to be the big thing for Christians. He didn't say, go into all the world and dialogue. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And Paul disputed. He argued. Well, we are told by Jude to earnestly contend for the faith. And Paul contended for the faith. He said, you are wrong. You are going to hell, and I want to rescue you. There is no salvation except in Jesus Christ, and he is God who came to this earth as a man. And I can prove it. All the evidence is there. The prophets foretold it in the Old Testament. Go down to, well, verse 23. Uh, we, we must read, after that, Many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Paul was so convincing in his arguments. He confounded them. They couldn't refute it. <laughs> and they had two choices. Either they are going to embrace this Jesus as the Messiah, or they're going to kill his messenger. And they would not give up their firm position. And so... They went about to kill him. Go down to verse 29. He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. He confounded them as well. He spake boldly. One of the problems, we have uh, Christians who are afraid to speak out. They tell the story of the young man. Uh, he was in university. He was a, a committed Christian. Uh, and uh, uh, he had a summer job up in the logging camp, up in the mountains, very rough, tough men up there, heavy drinkers and, and, and um, uh, sw sw you know, ungodly people. And his friends were a little worried uh, how he was going to make out. The only Christian in the logging camp all summer. And they prayed for him. And when he came back at the end of the summer, they said, how did it go, the only Christian? <laughs> How'd you get along, the only Christian in the logging camp with these ungodly men? He said, oh, they never guessed it. <laughs> We're not called to be secret service Christians. We're called to be witnesses and to speak out boldly. And if you know the facts, you can confound them. And... and we need to train our young people to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Muslim, an atheist, no matter who they are, and confound them from science, from philosophy. No, from the Word of God. Go to chapter 17 and see how Paul did it. I, I'm not telling you anything new. These are scriptures that we all know, but we need to be reminded sometimes. Now when they had, verse 1, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, if you, if you underline in your Bible, make any notes, mark that, or underline that, as his manner was. 
It's telling us this is what Paul always did. You want to know how he preached the gospel? You want to know what Paul did as he traveled around? As his manner was, he went in unto them, and three Sabbaths, three Sabbath days, reasoned with them from philosophy and science and his experiences and gave his testimony. No. Reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Opening this, their own scriptures and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, he is the Christ. Why did he focus on that? In particular, I'm sure he spoke of other things, but it's telling us his major focus was because the Jews were convinced that Jesus couldn't be the Christ because they killed him. Well, they didn't kill him. No man taketh my life from me, I lay it down on myself. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. But they thought they killed him. And so how could he be the Messiah? Well, if he wasn't crucified, he's not the Messiah. Go back and look at your scriptures, Paul would say to them. Let's, let's, let's refer. Psalm 22. They pierced my hands and my feet. All my bones are out of joint. You lift them up and drop it down in that hole. And, and, and the description is of a crucifixion. Centuries before crucifixion was ever known, was ever practiced on this earth. And if he wasn't crucified, then he's not the Messiah, because your own prophet said the Messiah would be rejected, he would be crucified, and he would rise again the third day. We mentioned it uh, last night or sometime yesterday, I think. Very often when somebody says, well, what is the gospel? Well, you get the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. No, that's not what it says. Remember what it says. How the Christ died for our sins, what? According to the scriptures. This has been foretold by the prophets. We have absolute proof that we can stand upon. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Paul goes in and he says, look what your own prophets said. Here it is, A, B, C, D all the details, where he would be born, when he would ride into Jerusalem on that donkey, that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, the details, that he would be crucified and so forth. All of the details are laid out centuries, some of them more than a thousand years before this happened. And you cannot explain it by chance. This is the word of God. And God has told you exactly how you would know who the Messiah was when he came. And you cannot deny all of this was fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And we are witnesses of his resurrection. Well, without taking more time on this, because this isn't really what I was going to talk about, go over to uh, chapter 18. Well, look at verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks Verse 19, he entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. But now, let's go down to verse 28. Now it's talking about Apollos. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing or proving by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. We need to be able to do that. And... We need to train our young people uh, to be able to do that so that they can speak boldly in the name of the Lord. Now, there are a lot of problems, and I, I wish we had time to deal with some of them, but let's just take a couple of them um, to show you the veracity, the truthfulness of the Word of God. Go back to chapter 13 of Acts, verse 7, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, and so forth, uh, the word in the, and I, as I often say, I don't, to, to encourage you, not to be funny, but to encourage you, I don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew. It could just as well be Chinese for me. But you can look it up in the indexes and the concordances as I do. The word there for deputy is antupatos. Now, that is a title belonging only to a man of proconsular dignity. And the skeptics, the atheists, they jumped on that. They have gone through the Bible with a microscope, and they have found things. 
and I have files, and I enjoy. When I was in university, I would go into the library and I read everything that I could find that the skeptics and the atheists had written in opposition to Christ, in opposition to the Word of God. I wanted to know what they had to say. And I can tell you, the more I read, the stronger my faith grew, because they had such pitiful arguments. There are no good arguments against the truth. But they jumped on this, and they said, no, no, there is, this is the island of Cyprus. There was never any indication in history that the deputy, the, the governor of Cyprus, had that dignity. He was not an antupatos. You couldn't use that title. The Bible's wrong. Well, what do you know? Whenever the skeptics say the Bible is wrong, the archaeologists dig a little bit deeper. And I guarantee you, they come up 100% on the side of the Bible. The Bible is always right. The archaeologists dug up a, a, a coin uh, minted in the reign of Claudius Caesar, and it showed that indeed Claudius Caesar had conferred that title upon this man. He wasn't on Thupatos. The Bible was accurate. Some people try to say, the Bible was written, you would find this in seminaries. Oh, the, the New Testament, that was written centuries later. I remember debating, we have in the United States, uh, 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 they call them the Jesus Seminar. You probably haven't heard of them over here, and that's just as well. But the Jesus Seminar, supposedly they call themselves biblical, uh, or Bible scholars. They all have PhDs and so forth, very uh, academically astute, etc. And I debated the head of it, uh, Rob, Dr. Robert Funk, on, on radio. One of the first things I said to him was, Bob, I'm sorry, you were born 1,900 years too late. We have eyewitnesses to what happened, and I can prove that these are eyewitnesses. You weren't even there. Who are you to say what Jesus said or didn't say or what happened back then? But we have these men, and they'll try to tell you, no, it wasn't written until centuries later. Wait a minute, you couldn't have put things like that. I'm taking too much time on this. I'll go over to chapter uh, 16. Uh, you couldn't have had this kind of accuracy. And the Bible allows questions to arise. For example, there are, and we won't have time to get into them, but somebody may try to stump you with things like this. Uh, we wrote a book in defense of the faith. We deal with some of these things. But there are seeming contradictions between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, in one, one gospel it says, Jesus said, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me thrice. Another one that says, before the cock crows, you will deny me thrice. Seem to be some problems about who saw the women and who, where they were and who, where, what did they see first and, and, and so forth. There, there are seeming contradictions. I'm going to just leave, leave you with that. You check it out for yourself. But there are seeming contradictions. Why? If you went into a court of law and you had four witnesses against this person, they all parrot the same words. I wouldn't believe them. It's a setup. But if they each witness from their own viewpoint, and they seem to contradict one another at key points, but when you investigate further, you find out, in fact, they are all in agreement. Now you've got a solid case. And this is why the, the New Testament the Lord allowed seeming contradictions here and there. You check them out, and you will find that they're all in agreement, and there is a solid case. But anyway, here's another little thing that you might find of interest. Verse 12, Acts 16, verse 12, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and so forth. The word there in the Greek is colonia. It's not just any colony. It is a Roman colony of a certain status. And again, the skeptic said, Philippi never had that status. Well, what do you know? And so the uh, archaeologists come to our rescue. And they found a medal. And it showed that Julius Caesar had indeed conferred that honor upon the city of Philippi. Now, what I'm saying is, you couldn't have been this accurate if this thing had been written <clears throat> uh, centuries later. Go to tw chapter 23 real fast. One of my favorites, because I love Paul. Chapter 23, verse 1, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I 
have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth because he didn't believe you could live in good conscience before God. And I, I love Paul. He's, he is no wimp. Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. You sit there judging me according to the law, and you command me to be smitten contrary to the law. God will smite you, you whited wall. And verse 4, they that stood by, they're shocked. They said, revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, it's the old English, I didn't realize, brethren, uh, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Now, we could have an exam, and I could say, do you see the problem there? It's amazing how, as Christians, we can read something like that. There is a major, major problem. And we don't even see it. But I guarantee you, the atheists, the skeptics, the critics, they don't pass over that. What's the problem? Well, look, a few chapters earlier, we have uh, Saul, who became Paul. We have him on the way to Damascus, and what does he have? He has letters, authority from the chief priests to bind the Christians. This man was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, it says. And now he's standing there, and Ananias, the high priest, is sitting there in his high priestly robes, and Paul is so ignorant, he doesn't know he's a high priest. Ah, uh, you got a real problem. <laughs> well, Josephus, the historian, comes to our rescue, as he does very often. And um, look, I'm not, I know nothing about it. My wife is the historian. I don't know anything about history. She's read the whole the ten volumes of Will Durant's History of Civilization, and she tells me where to look. I don't know anything. But uh, Josephus says... Ananias had been deposed as high priest. They removed him from office. His successor had been murdered. And now Ananias had unlawfully usurped the place of high priest. Now you understand Paul. He's no wimp. He's saying, oh, didn't realize the guy was a high priest. Really? Really? <laughs> well, I didn't know that. I mean, that's amazing. In fact, you're not the high priest. Now, again, you couldn't have written that centuries later and had this kind of accuracy. Uh, this is God's word. It is, as the pastor intimated, prophecy is really the powerful part. And, and Peter, there, after he tells, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, after he tells the, uh, his amazing experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus is transformed before them. It's a prelude of his coming kingdom. And here comes Moses and Elijah. And they're, you know, by the way, some people try to say, the reincarnationists say, because Jesus said, this is Elijah. John the Baptist was Elijah. Oh, I guess John the Baptist was the reincarnation of Elijah. Wait a minute, Elijah, <laughs> he didn't die. Uh, and there he is in his, in, in his body talking with Jesus. <laughs> so I don't know how... John the Baptist could be the reincarnation of Elijah if Elijah didn't even die. And here's Elijah himself. But anyway, uh, uh, that's, that's another topic. But Peter says, we had this amazing experience. We heard God speak with an audible voice. And you've got to believe on that basis everything I say. Is that what he says? No. He says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. For unto you do well that you give heed, as unto a light shining in a dark place, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Prophecy is the great proof of the Bible. The Bible is about 30% prophecy. We mentioned it the other night, uh, Friday night, I think. And you know that as well as I do. Two major topics, Israel and the Messiah who comes to Israel and through Israel to the world. And we are not going to get into that again. But there are some very interesting prophecies. There are so many things in the Bible. I keep discovering them. And I'm going to give you one in a, in a minute. <laughs> uh, but 
if you went to, well, just turn there real fast. Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. This is when God takes his people out of, out of Egypt. He gives them the Passover, remember? And verse 14, he says, This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. That's a prophecy. If that didn't happen, the Bible isn't true. And if you went to Israel today, 30% approximately is <clears throat> the latest figure that I know anyway. About 30% of the Israelis claim to be atheists. Most of them don't believe anything. I mean, we were visiting Israel, and we were on a, a kibbutz right below the Golan, and they were describing how they saw those tanks come pouring across, those Syrian tanks come pouring across the Golan and, and so forth. And the leader of the kibbutz who was showing us around, he was boasting that he was an atheist, and 90% of the kibbutzim are atheistic. Well, they were communistic. And I, I, I said, I was astonished. I said, you're an atheist. Yes. You don't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No. I, I said, you don't believe that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gave this land to the Jews? No. Well, I said, what better claim do you have to it than the Arabs? But they don't believe. And yet they keep the Passover. I've, I just read some statistics. Last Passover, 99.9% .9 of the Israelis in Jerusalem kept the Passover. I think it was 94.5% in Tel Aviv or something like that. God said, you will keep the Passover. In all your, and they don't believe it. It's tradition. How can tradition be so strong? Well, let's make some comparisons, which I, which I like to do. Let's take the sacred fires of the goddess of Esther, tended by the Vestal Virgins in Rome. And their prophet said, those sacred fires will never, ever go out. Are they still burning today? No. They went out. How about the sacred fires of the Zoroastrians in Persia? Their prophet said, these sacred fires will never, ever go out. Well... You probably know they were extinguished by the Muslims in the 7th century when they came in and took Persia and converted them at the edge of the sword. Well, you have a few Zoroastrians around the world have a little fire in their hearth, but not the major sacred fires of Persia. They're exterminated. But God said, you will keep the Passover forever. Do they keep it? They keep it all over the world. That's a prophecy fulfilled. Most prophecy has already been fulfilled. And, and, or is in the process of being fulfilled. Well, maybe that's a lucky hit. Uh, did God ever say some things wouldn't happen? I mean, you know your Bible. We give you all kinds of things. Yes, go to Hosea 3, 4. And God said, Israel will be without a priesthood. They will be without a sacrifice. They will be without a temple and so forth for many, many years. Have they been? Yes, they have been. And that's a good question to confront your Jewish friends with. I like to ask them this. What do you do about sin? What, how, what do you do about sin? We're all sinners. Now what are you going to do about it? God gave you the sacrificial system, didn't he? And the high priest went into the holy place once a year uh, and he offered a sacrifice for his own sins, the sins of the people. And there were various sacrifices for sin. Now what what do Jewish people do today about, about sin? What have they done for 1900 years? You don't have a temple, you don't have a priesthood, you don't have a sacrificial system. Exactly what God said. But now, what do you do about sin? They don't have an answer to that. Well, now, there is an answer. Either God has left you without a solution for sin for 1900 years, or Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifices. And he paid the penalty for our sins. And we do have a solution. Well, that's a wonderful prophecy. It's kind of obscure. It's very interesting. But turn to Malachi. I want to show you. I can get excited 
you know, you have to be very careful when you start reading the Bible and talking about it because you could get excited. Um, and uh, I could get excited about the scriptures. Uh, Malachi 1, verse 11. This is one of the most amazing prophecies in scripture. And for years, I mean, I could quote this verse. I never noticed that it was a prophecy. And I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, I was sitting in a Bible study, and the Bible teacher, this wasn't even his topic, he was talking about something else. And I don't know even the connection, but just as he was closing, he read Malachi 1.11. And I was sitting there, and I said, and I yelled it out, that's a prophecy! Wow! That's a prophecy! Because <laughs> I get excited about prophecy. Because prophecy is the great proof that the Bible is God's word. And God tells you that. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, he says, I'm God. I want to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. So when it ha happens, you'll have to admit that I'm God. Let's read verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and that is the non-Jews, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, and I think there's a contrast between the incense offered by the Orthodox and the Catholics and the pure offering, the sacrifice of praise of our lips. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. I love the way it says it. The Bible is just such an exciting book. He doesn't say, well, one day there's going to be an awful lot of people out there, and they'll honor my name. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, my name will be great among the nations. Can you find the rising of the sun? Can you find where the sun sets? Worldwide, everywhere you can go on the face of this earth, my name will be great among the Gentiles. Wow. That must have shocked the rabbis. I don't think they could understand it. Get the picture. The Jews are his chosen people, are they not? Why, Psalm 95, 6, many, many places you'd find it. It says, the gods of the Gentiles, the gods of the nations are idols. You serve the one true God. You are my people. And suddenly God says, shocking, you know what? The Gentiles, worldwide, they will be trusting in me, and my name will be great among the Gentiles. You realize what an amazing prophecy that was? Now, it's even more amazing how it came about and why. But, but get, the, get the picture here. Verse 6, a son honors his father, a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised my name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? Go to verse 10. Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. You've got to be paid for everything, even shutting the door. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Wow, what an indictment. Go to chapter 2, verse 2. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. This is not anti-Semitism. This is, uh, this is a, a Jewish, a Hebrew prophet himself. Just go to Isaiah chapter 1. I mean, you know, you know the scriptures, I, I, I hope. Uh, you read it all through the prophets. Something has happened. God has been so patient with these people. But his patience 
has worn out. And furthermore, they are a disgrace to him. Verse 2, Isaiah 1, 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed long ago. He's talking to Israel now, and this is what he's calling them. Verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Whoa. And Malachi is the last prophet of Israel. And there are 450 years of silence. And the last word from God is an indictment of his people. Now, he has not cast off his people. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Uh, there are people in the church today who try to say, well, the Jews are finished. No, they are not finished. Uh, Jeremiah 31, read from verse 35 on. It says, Israel will not cease to be a nation from before me forever. If they do, there's no stars in the sky. There's no tides in the ocean. There's no sun and moon up there. The whole universe is finished. That's how important it is that Israel remain a nation. And God promised he would bring these people back in unbelief into their chosen land and uh, some of the worst times yet lie ahead. But he's going to redeem his people. And finally, all Israel shall be saved. Zechariah 12.10 when Jesus intervenes in the midst of Armageddon to rescue his people, they will look on me. This is Yahweh speaking. And he says, they will look on me, whom they have pierced. Jehovah's Witness, when was your Jehovah? When was your Jehovah pierced? Jews, when was your God, when was your Yahweh pierced to the death? They will look on me, whom they have pierced. And they will mourn because of him. He and I are one. And God returns to rescue Israel in the midst of Armageddon. And what do you know? He is a man who was pierced to the death and who has been raised to new life. And he comes in his resurrected, glorified body to rescue his people. And they all recognize and realize this is the one they've rejected all these centuries. And they put their faith in him. But at this point, it's horrible. Israel has rejected, and in fact, the prophet said that when the Messiah comes, his own people would despise him, reject him, and crucify him. But to get to the point here, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Wow. That's a new idea? No, it is not a new idea. Scripture builds upon Scripture. And we could go back, well, you could go back to Genesis 12. When God promises Abram the land, what does he say? In thy seed, I'll bless him that blesses you, I'll curse him that curses you, and in you and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. We could give you prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament, but the disciples didn't know it, the rabbis didn't know it. And when Jesus said, go into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. His disciples didn't, didn't get that. God had to send a, a sheet let down from heaven for Peter. And he had to speak to Peter with an audible voice. And he had to tell him, he had to send a man from the household of Cornelius, some servants, and send Peter specifically to go to the household of Cornelius to bring the, 
the gospel to him. And when Peter came back to Jerusalem, you know that the other apostles jumped on him. You went in unto the uncircumcised. You ate with Gentiles. They could not believe the gospel was to the Gentiles. But Jesus knew. Was it to the Gentiles? Well, let's, let's look. If we try to wind it up here, look at a few scriptures. How about Psalm 22, where it prophesies his crucifixion? Verse 14, we refer to it. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it's melted in the midst of my bowels. Dogs have compassed me, verse 16. The, that's Gentiles. The assembly of the wicked, that's the Jews, have enclosed me. They pierced my hands, my feet. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But you know those scriptures. Go down to verse 27. All the kindreds of the world shall remember. Remember what? Remember the crucifixion. Do you meet to remember Christ's death, burial, and resurrection? You take the bread and the cup? <laughs> David said, the whole world will remember this. And turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Just real fast, go to some other scriptures. It's all through the Bible. The disciples didn't know it. You remember what Jesus said to the two on the road to Emmaus? They were so upset, they are so downhearted, and Jesus draws along that they don't, they don't recognize him, they don't expect him. They don't think he's alive, although he told them he would rise from the dead. And he says, what's your problem? Why are you so sad? Whoa, are you a stranger here? And you don't know about Jesus of Nazareth, and prophet mighty in word and deed before God and all the people. And we were sure that he was the Messiah, but obviously he couldn't have been. I guess we were mistaken because they killed him. They crucified him, and, and now it's the third day, and some of our company went to the grave. It's empty. Somebody stole his body. We don't even have a memorial place, you know, where we could put a monument or something. I don't even know who stole his body. And you know what Jesus says? You idiots. <laughs> you fools, he says. And slow of heart. Why does he say that? Slow of heart to believe what? all that the prophets have spoken. We've got a lot of Christians who don't know what the prophets have said. Therefore, they can't be like Paul and confound the unbelievers with proof from the scriptures. And then he, Jesus says the same thing that Paul said in, in, in Acts 17, where he knows, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Isn't that what the prophets said? And then it says, beginning at Moses and all, all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Remember, he said to the rabbis in John 5, you search the scriptures, but these are they that testify of me, and you won't come to me that you might have life. Uh, there's no excuse. So the scriptures are full of it. Did I say Isaiah 49? Um, verse 6. He said, this is God speaking, It is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel, I will also give thee for a light, what? To the Gentiles. How about that? That thou mayest be my, what? Salvation unto the ends of the earth. That's when it really gets exciting. How, how is God's name? How does it become great from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same? Great among the heathen. Because you've got 144,000 Jewish evangelists running around and converting everybody to Judaism? No, they don't convert people. It will be great because salvation is going to be preached in my name. What's my name? <laughs> Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born. That's the babe born in Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given. That's the eternal son of God. The government will be upon his shoulders, so you know that he's the Messiah. Of his kingdom and peace will be no end. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful. Counselor. You don't need to go to some psychologist, Christian, or atheist for counsel. Jesus' name is Counselor. Go to him and to his word for counsel. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. What? The Mighty God. The Everlasting God. Father, it is through the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And what is his name? He is the mighty God. It is through Jesus. Wow. 
What, what, what's the rabbi going to say about that? You Gentiles, you got the wrong God. You got this Jesus you believe in. Really? But the scripture said it would be through him that God's name would be great among the Gentiles from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. I think you could get a little bit excited about that. Just look at, look at chapter 52 and verse 10. The Lord, I mean, we can give you many scriptures, and I've got to try to stop. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Chapter 53, you, you know the scriptures. He dies uh, to bring sal salvation. You will call his name Jesus, means Jehovah saves. Uh, Matthew 1, 21. For he shall save his people from their sins. His name is Jehovah saves. But he saves his people. He must be Jehovah. He must be Yahweh. We can't ex explain it the way I and my father are one. So when Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, that repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations. Isn't that what he said? Jesus was not inventing something new. As Paul says in Romans 1, I am an apostle separated of the gospel of God. What does he say? Which he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. I wish we had a few hours. We're gonna, we, we've got to stop. I wish we had a few hours. I mean, this book is so exciting. And I can't prove to you from the Scriptures. Paul opened the Scriptures. It is so fantastic. I want you to have a solid basis for your faith. Not just, well, I was raised a Christian, you know, I'm in a Christian family, and my parents were Christian, my grandparents were, I'm going to be a Christian. Why do you believe what you believe? You better have a good reason for it. And we need to give people a solid basis for their faith. And there's a whole lot more uh, that could be said, as you know, because the Bible's a big book, and my wife says, don't try to tell them everything you know every time you stand up there. Um, <laughs> And, and we don't have time for that. My wife is my best critic, and she tries to keep me in line, and she's taught me a lot, uh, but there's still a lot more that she has to teach me. But, uh, well, you know, a, a little bit of humor. We, as the people of God, we can laugh, and we can rejoice, because we have solid evidence for what we believe. And I want to just give you an illustration, uh, and, then, and then be done. You know, there are people who say they believe in Jesus, but they call themselves Christians, but they've got to, got to have some kind of an insurance policy on the side, you know. Uh, maybe I, by good deeds, you know, I'm not so bad, and I'm, uh, uh, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, but you know, um, no. well, I don't know if you remember the man, his name was Blondin. He was the world's greatest tightrope walker. He came from England, and he went to North America. This is a true story. And he stretched, they stretched a wire across Niagara Falls. Now, that's not as big as Victoria Falls, but I tell you, it's huge. And uh, I don't know how they got that wire across, but they, but they did. And Blondin would walk across that wire. No net underneath. <laughs> he would carry a man on his back. He would go out there and sit and eat lunch. Uh, and the gamblers were always gambling that he couldn't make it. And one day a huge wind was blowing. And in order to win their bet, the gamblers cut the guy wires that held this taut. And it sagged. And Blondin was out in the middle with a man on his back. This thing is swinging. And the man is getting seasick and vomiting. And Blondin made it to the other side. He was the greatest. And so there was an older gentleman like myself standing in the crowd of onlookers and talking about what does it mean to really trust in Jesus, to know that you have eternal life, and not to have a doubt, and to be absolutely certain of this, to have confidence. And he was trying to explain it to this young man. He wasn't getting the point across. And finally he said to the young man, 
what, what do you think of Blondin? <clears throat> oh, he said, he's the greatest. He's fantastic. Do you think he can carry a man on his back? Oh, I don't have any doubt about that. I've seen him do it. Well, he's just walked to the other side, and when he comes back, he's going to ask for a volunteer. Will you be the man? <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> not me. That's the difference between an intellectual belief in Jesus and absolute total confidence in him. The scripture says, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. But he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And I just want to challenge you this morning. Have you really believed? Do you really know? Are you absolutely confident? And your trust is in him. And he's carrying you. You're not carrying him. He's carrying you, and he will take you into eternity, and you are just perfectly content and certain of this. Well, you should be. And I hope that some of the things that we've said from the scriptures will help to strengthen your faith. And if you have not opened your heart to Christ, this one of whom the prophet spoke, you can't explain it away. They foretold all of this. He came, the Lamb of God. He paid the penalty for your sins. Look, you can't get to heaven on any other basis. You can't make up for breaking the law in the past by keeping the future. I think you know that. The penalty had to be paid. It wasn't just the nail that he hung on a cross. That's what men did to him. That would only add to our condemnation. It was because as he hung on the cross. It pleased Yahweh. It pleased Jehovah to bruise him. Thou hast put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah 53. You know the scriptures. That as he hung there, he paid the penalty that his own infinite justice required. The penalty is paid. It is finished. And in the Greek, that's an accounting term that means the debt is paid in full. And now I believe his promise. I believe what he's accomplished. And I believe that he offers eternal life as a free gift. And you know you can't pay for a gift. You can't merit a gift. The only way you're going to have a gift, you must receive it. And if you try to pay for it, through your good deeds, through your church membership, it's an insult. You are actually, when you try to pay for the gift that God offers you of eternal life, you try to pay for it with your good deeds, your church membership, whatever, you are actually rejecting that gift, are you not? If someone offers you a birthday present and you insist on paying for it, what are you doing? You are refusing to accept the gift. You can't pay for it. Only Jesus could pay for it. And I hope that every one of you has received that gift. You, you, look, if you're a sinner, you, you qualify. If you're hopeless and unworthy, un, unworthy of eternal life, but worthy of eternal damnation, you qualify. And it, Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so I hope that this has been the experience of all of us. Father... Thank you for your word. Thank you for the certainty of your word. Thank you for the proof, the absolute, irrefutable evidence that it gives us. And Father, I pray that you have spoken to each of our hearts this morning. And if there are any here who have never believed on Jesus, never opened their hearts to him, I pray that they would do so before they get up from their seats, that they might know that they have eternal life. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.